Uh, it's about uh, local time. That's a little after four in the afternoon, local time. And I've decided to, uh, I'm not going to try to get all the way to Lunenburg today. But I'm going to try this anchorage behind Covey Island and West Spectacle. Uh, and according to the cruising guide, that's the Covey Island where the originally the Covey Island boat works. Uh, they, they built some beautiful boats. They built the Westerman, the Westernman 40s, and the, uh, I think the other one was the 56, Eleanor Mary. They were gorgeous boats. So anyway, according to the chart, we should get into a nice little sound here. Um, I'll tell you, when you look at it from sea, it's hard to... I mean, it looks like we're just sailing straight into land here, but... Um, its uh, appearances are deceptive until you get up close. By the late afternoon sun, we're coming up on the lighthouse on East Mosher. That is East Ironbound Island. So, correction, that is West Ironbound Island. This, with the lighthouse, is Mosher Island, and I think that next one after it, that's East Spectacle. And then uh, after that is West Spectacle. So my first, looking at the chart, I think a good place maybe to anchor is right just uh, west of West Spectacle. It might be sheltered enough in there, we'll see when we get in there. All right, changed my mind. I see some boats anchored up ahead here, so I'm just going to go up and anchor where he is. Yeah, peer pressure. Though it's not noted in the cruising guide, nor is there an anchor symbol on the chart, I found it to be a near perfect overnight anchorage. But nonetheless, I'm eager to get to Lunenburg, so I'm underway bright and early this morning. Well, I won't argue that the view has got to be pretty awesome, but especially that gray house right at the top of the bluff there, just seems to me that's got to be kind of a breezy place, especially in the winter. You get these screaming gales come up the coast. Yowie! Coming up on Lunenburg, that little lighthouse just right off the port bow, that's Battery Point. And uh, looks like this shouldn't be too difficult, but I can't really see yet, even through the binos, how much room there is in the harbor. And I'm coming downwind into a strange harbor, so that's always... Uh, I'm going to get up here to this green bell, I'm going to take the staysail down and just uh, go down to the reef main. And, um, and get the anchor, make sure the anchor's ready to drop in an instant, uh, just in case. That looks like more like kind of a French design. That big long nose pole there. Beautiful, beautiful. And so we arrive in the famous seafaring town of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia.
okay yeah. to go aboard? Yeah, please do. Oh, all right, I'll take it. Yeah. Good morning. In his autobiography, Wanderer, author, sailor, and later Hollywood actor Sterling Hayden writes about that final race series between the Gertrude L. Tabo and the Blue Nose. Hayden was, in fact, crew on the Gertrude L. Tabo for that race series. And he writes, Captain Angus Walters swung his big salt banker Blue Nose in past the Boston lightship, strapped her down, and sent her rampaging up the harbor in time for a welcoming luncheon thrown by the governor on behalf of the Commonwealth. Those who were there pronounced it a dandy affair. Plenty of dames, plenty of booze, plenty of platitudes. Captain Angus wasn't there. He stayed by his vessel instead. Let him spout, he barked. I'm getting ready to race. October came in like a lamb mewed for a few days, roared like a lion for the better part of two weeks, and then trailed off into November. The first two races were sailed in moderate winds and sunshine. Tabo took the, third, the first one by 30 seconds, and Blue Nose waltzed off with the second. During the scheduled three-day hiatus that followed, Gloucester got down on its knees and prayed for a living gale. While Gloucester was busy praying, Angus Walters took advantage of the moonless midnight hours to scan the weather forecast and juggle around with his ballast. When the clerk of the weather predicted a breeze of wind, into the blue nose went a few extra ton or two of pig iron ballast. When the clerk called for light airs, back on the wharf went the pigs. Pretty clever. It was also against the rules that governed the races. But Captain El Elroy Proctor of the Master Mariners Association and Miss Ray Adams, Ben Pine's partner, were pretty clever too. They sprinkled a layer of sand over the ballast pile, and Angie was caught red-handed. Some cute, said Gloucester. What Angus said did not appear in the Gloucester Times. Everybody shrugged. After all, the little, little Lunenberger was more than just a crack racing skipper. He was a renowned as a dairyman, and like all businessmen, he wanted to win in the hell of your goddamn rules. The skipper of the American vessel was Captain Ben Pine, of which Hayden writes, Half past ten, says a belfry clock. Captain Ben Pine stands by the wheel. You would swear he was part of his ship, in spite of the blue vested suit, the felt brown felt hat, and a red bow tie. More like a coach he looks than a racing schooner skipper. A motor launch tows the Tabo free of the wharves and holds her head to wind. You can set your mainsail now, says Ben says softly. Forty men to the halyards, peak to starboard, twenty men to a side, to lay back hauling, grunting at first, then gasping. Big new halyards, an inch and a half in diameter, the canvas flogs, all over the harbor you can hear it. Now go ahead on your foresail. Ben spits in his hands and paces in front of the wheel, feeling the wind engaging the heft of the ship. 
putting pieces together like an artist, working with wood and wind, buoys and rocks and anchored vessels, painting a wind-blown scene. Run up your jumbo and jib. His voice is edged now, the coach look lost. Decks a tangle of gear, mooring warps, gaskets, lift sheets, runners, tackles, and halyards. Ben spits as he gauges and measures. The tow line is gone and the bow cants fast off to starboard. She starts to move through the water. Most skippers would be content to run for the open sea, but not Ben Pine. Cordage bites into grooved oaked rails. Like an iron-capped lance, her bowsprit flies toward Sherm Tar's office window. A sharp puff rams home in her sails and lays the vessel over. Her rail smokes. Dead toward the dock she goes. Anyone who doesn't know schooners would swear something is wrong. She goes now. Better than ten she goes. Up aloft you hear a deep rumbling roar and the hissing of spray. Square in mid-channel lies an old-time sailing vessel, a brigantine with a Lascar crew, hailing from Ceylon. Her name stands out, Florin C. Robinson. With a thrust of his fist, Ben orders a man aloft. Up he goes on the run till he reaches the masthead, where he heaves himself over the hounds, breathing hard, and goes to work with the topsail. Stand by! Ben's voice betrays his calm. One final look, full circle, with an arm flung wide for balance. Now he claws at the wheels, fighting over it. Helms a lay! For the first time, he really yells out. She slashes into the wind, canvas boom and sheet blocks dance under the booms, straight into the eye of the wind. Not six feet separate her from the queer brig with the crew all wrapped in skirts and blankets, tumbling up on deck in response to a shipmate's warning. She passes across the wind, flung down to port. Let go your main sheet, boys. Ben is right where he wants to be. Clear that coil, now let her run to the knot. The sheet runs snaking out till the knot fetches up in the block. She swings toward the harbor entrance, and all around the harbor side, spurts of white stab from whistles, a pleasant sound on a southeast day with rain. Continuing on, a late October day and the racing is finished, forever. Moored to the dock in the place of honor lie the two great racing schooners, Victor and Vanquished, Blue Nose and Tabo. The former had retained her title as champion of the North Atlantic, taking the last two races by a wide margin in what Gloucester called with contempt New York Yacht Club weather. Both ships are dressed in flags this hot and windless day, and the traffic on Main Street is snarled. Tomorrow it will all be over, and the saloons will blossom with tables and chairs and benches. End of quotation. Of course, the salt bankers will be replaced by powered trawlers, which are able to catch far more fish with far fewer men and generally just make everyone's life easier all around, as the march of technology has always done and continues to do. In fact, technology has come so far and is so phenomenally successful that most of us in the developed world live lives that are completely insulated and removed from the harsh natural world which our forefathers dealt with on a daily basis. And while no one in their right mind would want to go back in time, Many of us have come to realize that a life that is too comfortable and easy is a life that is devoid of adventure and romance. And so many of us, like myself, find ourselves putting to sea in small sailing craft, pitting our wits and skill against the forces of the great oceans of the world, putting ourselves back in similar situations as our forefathers in order to recover this lost dimension of human experience. This memorial reads, dedicated to the memory of those who have gone down to the sea in ships and who have never returned, and as a tribute to those who continue to occupy their business in great waters. Consider supporting this channel by becoming a patron. As a patron, you will be able to view my videos free of ads. You will also be able to leave comments, ask questions, and message me directly. You can become a patron for as little as $5 a month.